All right. My name is Arvid, and I will briefly talk about the C++ abstract machine. The C++ abstract machine is the machine that your C++ programs run on. Uh, your programs are written for it. Uh, then you have a compiler that turns your code into machine code. The machine code runs on, a, on an actual machine. But your C++ code is defined in terms of an abstract machine, and the behavior of the program running on the concrete machine is uh, guaranteed to run at least one valid execution of one of many potential executions of your C++ program on the abstract machine. There are certain rules that you have to follow uh, in order for your C++ program to be a valid C++ uh, program and to be valid when it runs on the abstract machine. And only if you follow those rules will you have this guarantee of the concrete machine program uh, having the same behavior as uh, your C++ program. So that's your concern, that your program runs on the abstract machine. And that's the compiler writer's concern that assuming that you are following all the rules, the machine code runs correctly on the concrete machine. So I'm gonna briefly go through a few examples of statements that you might have uh, heard sometimes. They're completely made up, but sort of in the spirit of the things you might hear. I don't need to care about alignment. It's safe because I only run on x86, and we all know that x86 doesn't require uh, memory loads and stores to be aligned, right? This assumption is, is incorrect because uh, it assumes that the compiler will always generate uh, plain move instructions for all your uh, stores. Uh, but the x86 instruction set has plenty of uh, move uh, instructions that require, that do require uh, alignment. Here are a few examples. Uh, atomic operations, uh, all SSC instructions essentially have uh, alignment requirements. So the abstract machine has alignment requirements. Whether your concrete machine does or not might not be relevant. This is how you uh, copy an unaligned int into an actual int. You use memcopy. And you're telling the compiler that this might be unaligned by using memcopy. And your compiler will know, aha, on an x86 I can use move for that, and it will turn it into a move. Example two. This is a long statement. Uh, I only have a single thread writing to a variable, and all other threads are only reading it. And on x86, there are no torn reads and writes. So this doesn't have to be uh, the implied... Uh, uh, the implication of this statement is it doesn't have to be an atomic operation, because we know that there are no t uh, torn reads and writes. Uh, obviously, it's a data race, and data races in C++ are undefi uh, undefined behavior. So basically, anything can happen. Uh, but con more concretely, uh, non-atomic 64-bit uh, loads and stores do tear on 32-bit architectures, because the compiler will actually generate two instructions. Uh, and unaligned loads and stores also tear on x86, or they may tear. Uh, tearing meaning that one part of the value is written before the other, and when you read it from another thread, you might see a half update of it. Uh, but also, the compiler is allowed to introduce torn reads and writes because it knows that you're following the rules. It knows that this, these uh, variable accesses are not atomic, so it can do whatever it wants. It's all single-threaded. Here's an example. Imagine that you have this global variable that some other thread might be reading. You're assigning to it, and you're calling some expensive calculation function and assigning the, re the return. And you're assuming that that int will be atomically written there. But what if the expensive calculation really looks like this, and the compiler happens to see through your call and realize that it's really just calling two separate functions and assigning the upper half and the lower half separately from two separate uh, function calls? It could optimize it to something like this. And then you have a tone write. Instead, obviously, use an atomic and I said memory already relaxed because that's sort of the closest thing, but you probably want sequential consistency in reality. 
Example three, signed overflow, my favorite. I rely on signed uh, integer to overflow with two's complements behavior. It's safe because I only run on x86. Uh, again, the compiler uh, defines uh, signed overflow to be uh, undefined behavior, so it will expect it to never happen. Uh, what your hardware does on overflow might not matter. Your compiler may not already have generated code under the assumption that it doesn't happen. For example, you have a function that tests if x plus one is greater than x. The, the only two options in this, in this scenario is that either x plus one is greater than x, or you invoke undefined behavior. And we know that you're not invoking undefined behavior, right? So this is just gonna turn into a call to foo, because it's always true. Example four, volatile. Maybe this is my example, uh, my favorite. Uh, I use volatile to synchronize threads. It's safe because it works in my compiler and architecture. This is one of the oldest uh, mis misconceptions, I think. Uh, volatile does not enforce ordering. It does not provide atomicity of updates. It does not provide any synchronization. There's no guarantee that any other thread will see your writes. Uh, it's, there's no guarantee that you will see them in the right order, and there's no guarantee that your write will happen atomically. It could, could be torn, for instance, uh, from the previous example. So here's another simple example. Let's say you have a volatile int f, that's a flag that says that the value has been calculated. Thread one calculates the value, sets f to one. Thread two checks, has the value been calculated? You know, it's, if f is one, it means it has been cal calculated, right? So then we go uh, and use f. Uh, but the compiler is allowed to reorder those because volatile doesn't mean that they need to happen in a specific order. So then, breakage. The correct, the correct solution is obviously to use an atomic operation to set f, because that guarantees atomicity and ordering. Yes? Um, if you make, you mean if you make both volatile? But I mean, the fact that B doesn't have any attributes, does it mean that the compiler is free to remove it anyway? Um, in, in, in this code, yes, but not in this one, because now you're telling the compiler there is some other thread that, you know, that I'm communicating with, and by setting F to one here, you're also telling the compiler not only to not move anything below that point, but it will also emit instructions to the hardware to say that it can't move things uh, after that point. And, and I really like this list so much, I had to include it. Uh, this is sort of a paraphrasing of Hans Böhm. Uh, there are three legitimate uses for volatile. Set jump, long jump, contexts, uh, memory modified by external agent or memory mapping, or signal handler mischief. If you're not doing one of those things, volatile might not be for you. All right, so to summarize, it's dangerous to rely on optimizations not to fire because there are so many things you can do inadvertently to make them start firing. For instance, upgrading a compiler. That may, might be easy to avoid, right? Don't upgrade your compiler. Um, enable link time optimization, right? The compiler will be able to see through more of your calls and be able to apply uh, more optimizations. Uh, changing command line switches can you know, alter uh, you know, you can, it can be more, become more aggressive at inlining and see through more calls. Or moving code into uh, headers so that they become inlined and uh, are seen through. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>